As the season approaches, we need to tighten up our rules, knowledge, and understanding. Let's get started today on the show. Stick around. Greetings and welcome back to another episode of the Basketball Rules Expert, the show where we take National Federation of High School Basketball Rules, we lift them off the printed page, breathe life into them, simplify, clarify, amplify, because we need to take them with us onto the basketball court because that's where it's most important. Greetings again, everybody. My name is Greg Austin with abetterofficial.com. I've been a high school basketball official here in the San Francisco Bay Area for over a decade. I understand the rules of high school basketball to a very high level. This show is all about helping you on a journey to becoming a basketball rules expert as well. Have to allow me a moment to give a heartfelt thanks to our show supporters. Alex Binder, Jeff Glynn, Jonathan LaMatina, Chet Cooper, and Daniel Huffman. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show? You can always buy us a coffee. There'll be a link in the show notes below. All right, today we are taking a look at some miscellaneous plays. We're just going to rip through some miscellaneous plays and so that we can adjudicate plays properly when they face us, when we are faced with the play scenario, when it occurs on the court, right? Having rules knowledge, when I passed the test, I got a 98 on the test. That's fantastic. That's fantastic, right? We, but the, the, the key moment of success is when we pass the test on the court, right? We're busy. Our mind is going in a game scenario, right? We are faced with a situation and it, you know, it's no longer a text-based situation. Now it's like, okay, this kid did that. And then this kid did that. And the coach then did this and we have to like sort all this stuff out in real time where we're also reviewing what just happened in the past and having that success on the court is really what it's all about, right? We, we have to adjudicate plays properly on the court. Let's get started today with our very first play scenario. A1 is dribbling in the front court. B1 reaches and deflects the ball, which hits A1's knee and caroms into the back court. A1 runs to the back court and is the first to touch the ball. The officials give the approved NFHS signal for a deflection and rule this a legal play. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Right? So we have a backcourt play to start. Player is dribbling the ball in the front court. A1, dribbling the ball in the front court. Defense deflects the ball, caroms off A1's knee into the backcourt. A1, first to touch and collect the ball in the backcourt. A very common scenario, and this is a backcourt violation by rule. When adjudicating backcourt plays, we have to be aware of team control, when it starts, when it ends, etc. That's a key component. Once we have team control on the court, in the front court, and the team is the last to touch the ball in the front court and the first to touch the ball in the back court, it's a simple violation by rule. Oftentimes, though, the deflection by the defense can confuse the officials. Right? We watch other levels of play, NBA, NCAA men. That deflection in that situation makes the retrieval of the ball in the backcourt legal. But the key components are Team A had team control in the front court. A1 was dribbling the ball, had player control. The ball was deflected by the defense off of A1's knee. They were the last to touch in the front court. They retrieve the ball in the backcourt. They are the first to touch in the backcourt. 
violation by rule. So in this instance, were the officials correct? Yes or no? No. No, they were not. This should have been a violation by rule. All right. All right, our officials are off to a, a rough start, missing their first call. Let's take a look at our very next play scenario. While making a throw in near the 28 foot mark in team A's front court, A1 passes the ball to A2 in the front court near the division line. A2 muffs the ball and the ball bounces directly into the back court where A2 retrieves it. The officials rule this to be a backcourt violation on Team A. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Throw in adjacent to the front court. It could be on the sideline in the front court. It could be on the end line in the front court. Throw in pass is released. Player on the court fails to catch the ball bounces off their hands, bounces off their head, etc. They touched it though in the front court, giving the ball front court status, and then they run into the back court and retrieve the ball, and the officials rule a back court violation by rule. We have to remember the components of a backcourt violation. We have to have team control on the court. We do have team control on a throw-in that's only there for the administration of fouls should a foul occur. We need to have player control on the court to establish team control on the court. In this instance where the player, the, the ball was inbounded, the player muffed the ball, we have no player control, therefore no team control on the court. The touch, therefore, in the back court, being the first to touch in the back court, is not a violation by rule because one of the elements is missing in determining whether a back court violation has occurred. We must have team control on the front court, in the front court, last hey, to touch. Can I ask you a quick favor? Court, if you're finding this first video to touch content valuable, in the back take court, just a in second, order to hit have the like a violation. Below. Really so in this YouTube instance, where the officials ruled a backcourt violation, were the, the officials correct? Officials, so that we can no. all get no, better they together. were not. Thank you. Our crew off to a poor start. Oh, and two out of the gate. Let's take a look at our very next play scenario. A double personal foul is ruled in the front court near the sideline while A1's try for goal is in flight. The try is successful. Team A has the possession arrow. The officials score the goal, report the double foul, and award Team A an alternating possession throw-in near the spot of the foul. Were the officials correct? Yes or no, right? Off ball, double foul. Maybe two players positioning for a rebound. Maybe uh, two players just engaged uh, off ball in some fashion. Try is released, foul is ruled, ball enters the basket. We have a double foul, great, great. Our rules knowledge, we have to have it with us on the court. In a double foul, what is the resumption after we report the foul? What is the resumption? Should we score the goal in this instance? Did the foul cause the ball to become dead? These are the questions we have to know, and we have to take them with us onto the basketball court. We have to have them available, right? Easy peasy. I know that. I know that. I know that. In this instance, a double foul does not cause the ball to become dead. Therefore, the result of the try shall count. We are going to score the goal. That's the case. When we have a double foul, double fouls always go to the point of interruption, right? If in the absence of the foul, what would be the point of interruption? The ball entered the basket and line throw in for the opponent with the ability to move. A non-designated spot throw-in would be the point of interruption. 
That's the adjudication on this play. It's not the spot nearest the double foul. It's not using the possession arrow. Uh, in this instance, we could possibly have a possession arrow scenario if there was no team control. If the try missed, then we would have no team control and we would need to go to the possession arrow. But in this instance, the ball went in. The proper adjudication would be an end line throw in for the opponent after all scoring and reporting was completed. So in this instance where the officials went to the arrow for the resulting throw and were the officials correct? No, no, they were not. Boy, oh boy, our crew is struggling, but let's see if we can get the next one right. Let's take a look at our next play scenario. A1 is disqualified for receiving a fifth personal foul. Later in the game, A1 re-enters the game as a substitute. The officials recognize it at the first dead ball after A1 re-entered the game. The officials rule a direct technical foul on the head coach of Team A. Were the officials correct? Yes. Or no? Hmm. So we have a player who's disqualified for their fifth foul. They, if they were also disqualified for a flagrant technical or a flagrant foul or had received two technicals, but by whatever method they have been disqualified. Later in the game, the player re-enters the game. And when, no, when uh, the uh, crew recognizes the situation on the court, the crew assesses a direct technical foul on the head coach. Our crew has gotten one right. <laughs> Pressure's off. Right. This is a correct adjudication of the play. If a disqualified player returns at the National Federation of High School Basketball level, that is the responsibility of the head coach. This is a direct technical foul on the head coach when recognized. Right. So the player had entered the game. Right. And had played basketball. And then during the first dead ball, the crew recognizes. But this, we, when we assess tactical fouls, we have to know, of course, the window of opportunity to assess a tactical foul. And this is a tactical foul that is um, applied when discovered. So it is discovered. Tactical foul on the head coach, two free throws by any player or eligible substitute for the opposing team and the ball for a division line throw in. So in the end, in this instance, where our crew said tactical foul on the head coach, was the crew correct? Yes, yes, they were. All right, our crew's improving. Let's take a look now at another play scenario. Upon returning to the court prior to the third period, the officials are informed that the official scorer took the book with them to the locker room at halftime. The officials rule a team tactical foul on the home team and begin the third period with free throws. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Crew is out on the court awaiting the start of the second half. Opposing coach comes over and says, hey, hey, ref, ref. They took the book with them to the locker room. That happened to me once and I got a technical foul. You got to go technical foul here. They cannot take the book to the locker room. Right? Imagine the scenario. It's like, this is not something that happens every day. And knowing the correct adjudication may be a challenge. We may have to get together as a crew. We may have to recognize what is legal at other levels of play, et cetera, and get to the correct ruling from by National Federation of High School Basketball Rules. Imagine this scenario, though, and it's easy to see how, okay, wait a minute, 
wait a minute, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to officiate. I'm not ready, you know, I'm not officiating during while I'm standing. I'm observing players, the clock, whatever's available on the court to observe at this point. This can be challenging. And there's a couple, there's a key thing we have to remember that I'll get to in just a little bit. So in this situation, NFHS has a case play and it says this is not something that is penalized by rule. If the officials um, feel that the book was compromised in any fashion, maybe a little erasing going on at halftime, then they can go to the um, uh, visitor book and make that the official book. Right. We would certainly want to verify the accuracy of the book. Um, we may need to get uh, coaches together and say, so we have a situation here that you cannot coach a you cannot remove this book to your locker room. That is not allowed by rule. Coach B, unfortunately, there's no penalty in this instance, and we will not. We will resume with an alternating possession throw in without penalty. I'm going to check the accuracy of the book and I'm going to make a determination about um, what which book we're going to use going forward. Coach A, you should not do this again in the future and I will be notifying my supervisor of this behavior or whatever. You could throw something in like that. <laughs> okay, and then we go through, we verify the book and we're ready to move forward. Also, so here's the deal. Remember, uh, remember, I said we'd we'd talk about a, a key thing. Imagine yourself. You're out on the court. You're ready to start the second half. This play, this scenario confronts you, right? Your 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 Rolodex of rules references is twirling in your head, right? As a crew, right? In the end, we have made a ruling. Right. We are going to assess the technical foul and that would be incorrect or we are not going to assess and that would be correct. But we have to move on. We have to move on from this adjudicating this unusual situation. We make a decision as a crew. We commit to it as a crew. We agree to it as a crew. We inform the coaches. We do that da, da, and then we move forward and put it behind us. Maybe after the game, we're running to the rules book and saying, did we get it right? Did we get it right? But we have to leave it behind so that we can continue to officiating the game, to officiate the game. So in this instance where our crew said no penalty, were the So in this instance where the officials ruled a team technical foul, were the officials correct? Yes or no? No. No, they were not. A team technical foul is not the appropriate ruling in this instance. All right, now let's take a look at another play scenario. After team B has another player foul out, they only have four eligible players. In a gesture of fair play, team A coach says that they will use four players as well. The officials rule that they may not do this and they must have five players participating. Were the officials correct? Yes or no, right? The team maybe starts with a limited number of players, have players foul out, and they only have four remaining. The opposing team says, I don't want to play against four, but I'll use four, you know, to make it fair, etc." And again, the officials say, no, coach, that's not allowed by rule. You must have five participating if you have five available, right? This is a unique situation, one that um, we're talking here about the correct rule on the play, right? We could easily see a scenario where, um, yeah, we could. Um, but by rule, a player is a team is not allowed in this instance to play with four when they have five available. It's a simple adjudication of the play. That is the correct ruling. So in this instance, I did the wrong thing. So in this instance where the officials told the coach he must play with five, were the officials correct? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, they were. Our crew is killing it, man. Come on. Everybody who gave up on our crew. Moving on, let's take a look at our next play scenario. Music 
after a made basket and after A1 has picked up the ball for the throw-in, B1 reaches through the boundary plane and slaps the ball out of A1's hands. The officials rule a delay of game warning, admonish B1 not to do that again, young man, then administer a throw-in to resume play. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Now, this show is all about adjudicating the rules according to the rules book, right? So, in this instance, we have a player who has the ball for a throw-in out of bounds. Something that's missing on the play is after a made basket, we would need to have an official's count in order for the throw-in to have begun something that isn't always present, even in the best of circumstances. But once the throw-in is begun, there are restrictions on defenders. The defender is not allowed to reach through the boundary plane and dislodge the basketball by rule. The correct adjudication would be a player technical foul for that action. In addition, if they had not received one earlier in the game, a delay of game warning would be uh, issued to the team as well. That would be the correct adjudication of the play. So in this instance, where the officials did not take that approach, were our officials correct, yes or no? No, no, they were not. Let's take a look at our next play scenario. A1's throw and pass from in front of his team's bench in an attempted alley-oop to A2. However, A2 jumps too early and the ball passes over his head untouched. The throw-in enters and passes through Team A's basket. The officials rule a violation on the play and resume with an end-line throw-in near the spot where the ball entered the basket. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Right, so a throw in from the sideline. Player th throws the ball high towards the basket so that their teammate can catch and dunk the basketball. But oops, the ball went in the basket. The officials rule a violation and resume with an end line throw in nearest the spot where the ball entered the basket. The 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 where the ball entered the basket. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? It is a violation to throw the ball into the basket during a throw-in. That is a violation by rule. Our officials were correct in that part of the adjudication. It's also a, a violation for a throw-in to become lodged between the basket and the backboard. It is not a violation for a player to throw the ball off of a basket or backboard during a throw-in. Sometimes that's a reaction play that officials make. It's like the ball hit the underside of the backboard. Oh, they put a whistle on the play, right? We want to adjude process those plays and get them right. Um, so that would be a legal play. But in this instance, the ball entered the basket. That's a violation by rule. Now, what kind of violation is it? That's really important because the administration of what happens next is based on the type of violation it is. For a throw-in violation, the, we resume play with a throw-in to the opponent at the spot of the throw-in, always, right? So if we have a situation where a player releases a throw-in pass and it goes untouched and exit the court way down at the other end of the court, we come back to the original throw-in spot because it is a throw-in violation. So in this instance, we have a throw-in violation. What are we going to take with us onto the court? It's always back at the throw-in spot. So in this instance, where officials said we're going to resume with a, with a throw-in under the basket, as a result of the violation, were the officials correct? Yes or no? No. No, they were not. Almost, but no. Now, is this a crime against humanity to have the wrong throw-in spot? Um, you know, almost 99% of the time, it is no big deal. But always when we want to, when we review plays, we want to 
it's always great to review them in the extreme. This is a tie game with two seconds remaining. That makes a difference in whether we have an end line throw in here or a sideline throw in. <coughs> it could make a difference. So, you know, a lot of times we come across plays and the play is like, come on, man. It, does it really matter if they did it on this side of the lane, that side of the lane, a uh, sideline throw in, end line throw in, et cetera? I mean, it matters for accuracy and that's really important. But, you know, the thing is that, that we get to end of game scenarios. And if we have a looseness in our understanding of how to adjudicate plays in the end of game scenario, it becomes a really big deal. So it's always great if we position our adjudication of plays towards when it matters most in the game. If this game, if this uh, mistake by the official occurs and the score is 85 to 22, who cares, right? But if this is a, a, a tournament game, state final, uh, a, a quarterfinal, uh, section final, the eighth grade middle school championship, and there's three seconds remaining, it could be a really big deal, right? So that's what we want our rules knowledge is always gearing us for. There's those key moments and key games so that we can, first of all, have confidence that we're going to adjudicate those plays properly. But of course, adjudicate those plays properly. If you find content like this valuable, now would be a great time to do all the things. Hit the subscribe button below so you don't miss out on any of our new content. Also, take a moment to hit the notify bell so you don't miss out when we go live, which is at least twice a week in the morning. Hey, let's take a look at our next play scenario. A1 is charged with her fifth personal foul and upset at herself, she reacts with a loud profanity. The covering official then also charges A1 with a technical foul. The officials rule that A1 is disqualified for getting the fifth foul and that the technical foul is also charged indirectly to the head coach since it occurred after the disqualifying foul. Were the officials correct? Yes or no. This play is from our recent uh, series on points of emphasis. This is a point of emphasis for National Federation of High School. I'm going to put a list, a link to the complete playlist up above. But players are not allowed to, uh, uh, they get no pass for um, unsporting action that's not directed at coaches, players, or the crowd, etc., but only at themselves. They do not get a pass from that. This is a proper uh, administration of a technical foul. It is a player technical on a player who had already received their fifth foul just moments before. The officials say, well, wait a minute, you got a technical after a fifth foul, so therefore that must be on the head coach. That's the rationale. But that is incorrect because we, what are we taking with us onto the basketball court? Fundamental understanding of when players become disqualified. A player becomes disqualified when the coach is notified that they have received their fifth foul. So until that moment, they are not bench personnel. Therefore, their actions as a player, as they are still a player, have no impact on the coach. A head coach is responsible for the behavior of bench personnel. If bench personnel commit a technical foul, it is an indirect on the head coach. That's a basic concept we need to take with us onto the basketball court. So in the end, this crew um, assessed an indirect technical foul on the head coach. Were the officials correct? No. No, they were not. Foul on the player, their fifth. Technical foul on the player, all correct, but the indirect component on the head coach was incorrect by rule. Really appreciate you joining the show today. If you are a basketball official and a find this content valuable, now would be a great time to do all the things. First thing, number one, hit like. It helps us with the YouTube algorithm, helps get the video in front of more basketball officials. In addition, hit subscribe. 
so you don't miss out on any of our new content and the notify bell so that you get notified whenever new content is available and you don't miss out. Allow me a moment to thank our fantastic show supporters, Alex Binder, Jeff Glynn, Jonathan LaMartina, Chet Cooper, and Daniel Huffman. Much appreciated and much love. You can always support the show. I'll put a link above and you know it. It's going to be in the show notes below. Additional video content is available for you here. I have chosen this video as the one to watch and YouTube's chosen this one as the one to watch. Make your choice, choose wisely, and we'll see you in the very next one. Take care.